Welcome to Chapter 4, Part 2. In this section, we're going to be discussing the structures of prokaryotes that are internal to the cell wall. This involves the plasma membrane, movement across the plasma membranes, cytoplasm, the nucleoid, ribosomes, inclusions, and endospores. The plasma membrane is the structure that marks what's outside the cell and what's inside the cell. It's kind of like a wall or a boundary and it's made up of phospholipids. To remind you from chapter 2, a phospholipid has a phosphate head that gives it a negative charge so it can interact with water and others and things that are in solution. Now the phospholipid has a lipid on the inside. These legs are fatty acids that are hydrophobic. They're excluded by the water so they interact with each other. They naturally form what we call a phospholipid bilayer. You have one layer of phospholipids and you have, going the other direction, another layer of phospholipids. Now to get things inside and outside of the cell, you have to wait for, have a way for them to get through. Um, because of the hydrophobic legs, water doesn't get through very fast and things like ions, big molecules are excluded entirely. So we have proteins that are embedded in the membrane that allow molecules to come in and out of the cell and also allow the cell to communicate with the outside world. Now for these proteins to be able to be in this hydrophobic inside, also going back to chapter 2, their side chains of the amino acids of that part of the protein have to be hydrophobic. Those that are sticking out have to interact with the phospholipid heads and also with the solution on the outside and the inside so their side chains have to be hydrophilic. Before we go too much further let's talk about diffusion and osmosis. Diffusion is what happens when molecules dissolve. Okay at least for the purposes of this class. So in this example we have some colored sugar and you'll see that it's dissolving and the color is dissolving moving throughout the solution like the sugar is. Now you'll notice that most of the color is down at the bottom and it's slowly spreading out. Now we call this diffusion the process of molecules moving through solution until they reach equilibrium, which is when the molecules of the solute are equally dispersed throughout the solvent. Now this happens because molecules are moving around continually and so they start bumping into each other and they ricochet off of each other and they have a tendency to move until they reach equilibrium. Until that point we say that the molecules of the solute are moving away from the area of highest concentration down the concentration gradient. Okay, It's most concentrated here, it's less concentrated here, everybody wants to move out to here. It's kind of like moving from the inner city to the suburbs. Everybody wants a little more space, a little more elbow room. Okay, That's diffusion. Now you'll notice that even though it's going down the concentration gradient, it's going up through the glass. Now here's another diagram showing what's going on here. Here's the molecules, they're bumping into each other and they're moving out away from the area of highest concentration down the concentration gradient. This becomes important later when we talk about energy uh, processes of the cell. Now let's talk about what happens if you put a barrier in it. Now suppose in this glass I put a barrier here that allowed water to move back and forth across because remember the water molecules are bumping into each other too. They're moving around. They're wanting to move um, toward the area of highest concentration. Okay. But if we put a barrier there and the sugar can't get past it, the sugar's trapped down here. So water is going to continue to move toward the area of greatest concentration trying to achieve equilibrium. We're going to give it human characteristics and say that it's trying to do this. We call this osmosis. So water is going to move toward the area of highest concentration when there is a semi-permeable membrane. 
a membrane that allows water to move through it, but not large molecules like sugar. So why bring this up? The plasma membrane is a semi-permeable membrane. Now that you have an idea of the structure of the plasma membrane and also about how molecules such as water move across the plasma membrane, let's talk about the ways that molecules can move to and from the membrane. Now there's what's called simple diffusion. That's where we have molecules that can get past the plasma membrane diffuse across. They're not kept out by the hydrophobic region and they diffuse from an area of higher concentration to a low area of lower concentration within the cell so they diffuse down the concentration gradient. This doesn't take any energy on the part of the cell. Now water can do this to a certain extent. Now you're probably wondering I said that water was excluded by the hydrophobic interior. Well, these guys are jiggling around, they're moving, and little holes open up. And water can just zip, zip, right through. But it doesn't happen very fast. There are other molecules that can get through without having to wait for a hole to open up. And these are small molecules and nonpolar molecules. So can you think of a few molecules that we've discussed that are uh, small and nonpolar. They're gases. Now, oxygen is small, just two atoms, and it's nonpolar. It has a nonpolar covalent bond. Now, you're probably going, hey, wait a minute. Oxygen is involved in hydrogen bonding. Well, that's only if it has a hydrogen. Okay? If it's two oxygens, it's nonpolar. Uh, carbon dioxide is another one. Okay, it's a carbon with two oxygens on it. And so these are able to diffuse in and out of the cell, which is a good thing because cells need to take in those gases and get rid of them. Okay, now if we need to let things in that are big or have a charge, we can have channel proteins. They're big, they're basically a hole through the membrane that can be open and closed and so molecules are allowed to diffuse through. This is called facilitated diffusion because the protein helps or facilitates the molecules in coming in and out of the cell. Sometimes the cell wants to bring in specific molecules. They're molecules that are in high demand. So in this diagram, these little squares, actually they're not squares, they're hexagons, represent six carbon sugars. Now cells want sugars, they use them to release energy, provide energy for the cells, so they're very interested in getting those sugars inside of the cell. So what happens is, is you have a transport protein that is only going to let in that shape of molecule. So it goes in, changes the shape of the molecule, and it spits that that sugar into the inside of the cell. Now unlike the channel proteins that we looked at in the last um, in the last picture, molecules can only go one way. So if we start to run out of sugar on the outside of the cell, it, we're not going to have them zipping back out through diffusion to the other side. We get to keep them all inside. Now we have some specific channel proteins that are just the right size and shape to allow water to go through. Now as we discussed before, water can diffuse through, but there are times when the cell needs more water in or out, and these are called aquaporins. You're familiar with pore being a hole, we have pores in our skin, and aqua being the Latin term for water. Now let's talk about what's inside the cell from the plasma membrane. We call this the cytoplasm. Cyto for cell. Plasm you may be familiar with if you've seen Ghostbusters. Remember the ectoplasm that the uh, ghosts would leave all over the place? Well this is plasm that is inside the cell. Um, cytoplasm includes both the things in solution and if you want to call it that the chunks that are inside of the cell. Now Let's talk about some of the things that are inside of the cell. Prokaryotes do not have nuclei. They don't have a nucleus. They don't have a membrane around their DNA. 
prokaryotes do have regions where their DNA, their chromosomes, are concentrated in this uh, transmission electron micrograph, you can see the nucleoid. We call it the nucleoid because it's like a nucleus. Now, current research has indicated that um, it's got protein around it protecting it instead of a lipid membrane. So it's kind of got a nucleus, but we don't call it a nucleus because it's not membrane bound. Now let's talk about ribosomes. Ribosomes are organelles, they're little organs inside of the cell that make proteins. Now they're composed of both protein themselves and ribosomal RNA or rRNA. They come together to form two subunits. You have the small subunit and you have the large subunit. They come together to make the complete ribosome and the complete ribosome makes proteins by hooking amino acids together. Now in later chapters we're going to talk more about how this happens but what I want you to remember for now is the size. This becomes important later when we talk about antibiotics. Um, prokaryotic ribosomes have a 30S and a 50S subunit. You put them together and you get a 70S ribosome. Now you're probably going 30 plus 50 is 80. Well, this isn't actual weight, this is sedimentation rates. But what I want you to remember is that you have a 30S, a 50S, and it makes a 70S ribosome. Inclusions are little blebs of stuff inside of the cell. In the book they talk about magnetosomes, kind of sounds like X, uh, the X-Men, doesn't it? But they're little blebs of iron containing stuff that uh, allows these particular bacteria to line themselves up with the Earth's magnetic field. I don't know why the book decides to go into it other than it's pretty darn cool. But most of the time inclusions are either food stores for the cell, can be either lipids or carbohydrates, neither of which stain very well, or they can be waste products that the cell is waiting to get rid of. There are some bacteria that develop sulfur as a waste product and they store them in inclusions until they can get rid of them. The last structure that I feel that it's important for you to know that are internal structures of prokaryotes is the endospore. The endospore is a survival mechanism for the cell. What happens is it with some bacteria that are able to form endospores is when times get tough, it gets too dry, there's not enough food, there's poison in the area, say from a disinfectant or from biological warfare of other bacteria, they will produce endospores. So what happens is, is they make a copy of their DNA and they put it into kind of like a little escape pod for the, uh, for the DNA. And they wrap it with all sorts of proteins and lipids and different things and they move most of the water out. So endospores are highly resistant to heat, radiation, disinfectants, and other sterilization methods. And uh, the DNA just kind of sits there. Well, there's ribosomes and different things in there too. Waiting for things to get better. Then when times get better, they hatch out and they grow into what we call is a vegetative cell. This is a cell that's not asleep, it's not in suspended animation. It's um, living and growing and eating and producing waste and different things. And it's far less resistant to heat, drying, all of these other things. So the endospore is a way for the bacterium to survive bad times. Now, unlike other kinds of spores that you will probably hear about, fungal spores, um, and different things like that. Those uh, fungal spores are reproductive. One fungal cell will make at least four. Whereas a bacterium makes one endospore, one endospore turns into one vegetative cell. It is not reproductive. You're not getting any more bacteria out of it. So it's non-reproductive and it's a survival mechanism. And not all bacteria make them. On to eukaryotic cells. As you may remember, eukaryotic cells have a nucleus. That's what separates them from the prokaryotes. And we're going to discuss flagella and cilia, the cell wall and the glycocalyx, structures internal to the cell wall, and evolution of eukaryotic cells. Eukaryotic flagella have a much different structure than prokaryotic flagella. For one thing, they're encased in a membrane. And so technically they are from the inside of the cell and they have these little 
tubes that uh, are arranged. You've got sets of two that go around and then you have two that are inside and these are called microtubules, mini tubes, and they are made of tubulin. You're probably wondering why in the world I'm having you remember this, but your body recognizes flagellin as being foreign, but it doesn't recognize tubulin as being foreign because it has tubulin. So this becomes important when we talk about immunology. And they move differently. We have protein structures connecting these microtubules and when they contract they bend the flagella back and forth and you get motion like this. We call it a wave-like or a whip-like motion. Now cilia are short flagella and we only see this in eukaryotes. Prokaryotes do not have cilia. Okay? Their flagella are long, relatively stiff, and turn in a 360 motion. Now I'm going to put in some video clips showing actual moving cells. Here you see some bacteria swimming around. You'll notice the flagella go 360. They're like little outboard props. See, it's going around and around and around. Here we've got a human sperm and there's a flagellum coming out of the back and you'll notice that it goes back and forth, back and forth in a wave motion as opposed to uh, with the bacteria where you had it turning 360 like a little propeller prop. So that is the difference between the motion of bacterial flagella and eukaryotic flagella. Let's talk about eukaryotic cell walls and glycocalyx. First off, most eukaryotic cells have a cell wall, but animal cells do not. You as an animal do not have a cell wall. Instead, you have something similar to the glycocalyx of bacteria and uh, because it's helping to connect your cells together and communicate with each other as multicellular organisms. Um, other eukaryotic cells that don't have cell walls also have a glycocalyx that prevents them from drying out and it helps stick them to different things similar to the function of uh, the bacterial or prokaryotic glycocalyx. Now eukaryotic cell walls can be composed of lots of different things. Plants and algae are composed of cellulose. Um, some pro protozoa are composed of silica, glass, diatoms and such things. They can be composed of calcium carbonate. They're eh, kind of the same thing that your bones are made out of. Okay? But they are never composed of peptidoglycan or pseudopeptidoglycan. And fungi in their cell walls have chitin. Now on to the structures that are internal to the cell wall of eukaryotes. Now you'll notice there's a whole lot more structures that are internal to uh, eukaryotics than there are to prokaryotes. Now part of this is because we're more familiar with eukaryotes. Uh, we've been studying for longer, they're bigger, and it's easier to see stuff inside of them. Recent research has shown that uh, we keep finding more and more structures on the inside of prokaryotes, but they've been so small and we've needed better microscopes to be able to see them. So in the end, we may find that prokaryotes are just as complicated as eukaryotes. But as for what we're going to talk about with eukaryotes, we're not going to talk about all of these things that are listed. I want you to read this part in the textbook so that you're familiar with them, but I'm going to go over the things that I think are most important, which are the differences between eukaryotes and prokaryotes and things that I haven't mentioned previous to this. Eukaryotic ribosomes are a different shape from the prokaryotes and they're a different size. The small subunit is 40S, the large subunit is 60S, and they come together to make an 80S ribosome. This is what I want you to remember. This becomes important when we talk about antibiotics, that eukaryotic ribosomes are a different size and a different shape. Eukaryotic cells are full of membranes. That's part of what makes them eukaryotes. And they are um, phospholipid bilayers just like the plasma membrane, starting from the inside out. Inside we have the nuclear envelope that forms the outside layer of the nucleus, and we have pores. We have pores in the nuclear envelope, which allows RNA and different things to come in and out. Now, next 
to the nucleus is the endoplasmic reticulum. We're going to abbreviate this as ER. Now you have two kinds. You have rough ER that under the microscope it looks like it's embedded with little grains of sand and you have smooth ER. It's a little more tubular. Rough ER has ribosomes embedded in the membrane and it's the job of the rough ER is to make proteins that are going to stay in membranes. They're either going to be shuttled out to the plasma membrane or they're going to be used in membrane containing organelles inside of the cell. Now the smoothie the ER has all sorts of enzymes in it um, but we can't see them. They're too small for use with most of our microscopes and there the job of the smooth ER is to make lipids and carbohydrates. Now from the ER little blebs get pinched off we call these vesicles and they travel from the ER to the Golgi apparatus or the Golgi structure. It's called many names but Golgi is always in the name and they fuse with the Golgi and in here the things that were made in the smooth ER and the rough ER get processed. They get changed. Sometimes a lipid or a carbohydrate gets put onto a protein. And things get tweaked. Okay, so think of it as kind of the finishing area. You get the rough product here um, in the factory. You get the bolts and the parts of the bicycle frame gets moved here and the bicycle gets put together. Then vesicles bleb off and they go on to wherever their final destination is. Some of the um, vesicles that pinch off from the Golgi are lysosomes. Remember that lys means break. So lysosomes are full of hydrolytic enzymes. These are enzymes that break apart macromolecules by inserting water. Hydro for water, lytic for breaking. Now the pH of the lysosome is generally very low. It's acidic. These enzymes prefer to work in an acidic environment. Let's take white blood cells as an example. When a white blood cell in your body engulfs a bacterium, then it will fuse that vesicle that has the bacteria in it, we call it a phagosome, and it fuses with the lysosome and the poor little bacterium gets all chewed up by the hydrolytic enzymes. It's really kind of sad. It's a bad way to go. But I'm glad that my white blood cells do this because I don't particularly like getting sick. For the next two membrane bound organelles that we're going to talk about, mitochondria and chloroplasts, they're different from other organelles within the eukaryotic cell. First off, let's look at the mitochondria. It's kind of a kidney bean shaped organelle and it's got two membranes. It's got this inner membrane that has lots of folds. We call them cristae. And these folds are embedded with lots of enzymes that their job is to make energy for the cell. They produce a ton of ATP. Then we have this outside membrane and when we talk about energy production we're going to talk about that outside membrane some more. They also have their own DNA, little circular DNA, and they also have a few 70S ribosomes. Not very many. They don't make very many proteins, but they do make a few. They also divide on their own through binary fission. Now if we look at the chloroplasts, chloroplasts are found in algae and in plants. So you'll uh, do remember that all eukaryotic cells have mitochondria but only algae and plants have chloroplasts. And they've got kind of a double membrane system too. They've got an inner membrane, they've got an outer membrane, and then they have these stacks of membranes that individually they're called thylakoids. Put them together into stacks, they're called granum. And they're embedded with enzymes that photosynthesize. Okay. The granum have enzymes that um, are part of the light dependent photosynthetic pathway. You don't have to remember that for now, but the more times your brain has heard these terms, the easier it is to remember it. And then in between, in kind of the cytosol of the, of the chloroplast, you have enzymes that are part of the light independent pathways, photosynthetic pathways, or the carbon fixation pathways. Now chloroplasts also divide on their own through binary fission. They also have a little circular DNA and they also have 70S ribosomes. To finish up, let's talk about the evolution of eukaryotic cells. It's speculated that the nucleus came from an invagination of the cell membrane. You're going a who to what of the cell membrane 
invagination means a little bleb or a little pocket in something. So like if I had a balloon and I stuck my finger into it, my finger poking into it would be an invagination. So what they think happened is there is a bleb of membrane that went around the chromosome of eukaryotic cells and eventually pinched off to form the nucleus. Now mitochondria, if you'll remember mitochondria, they're small um, organelles within the cell and they have 70s ribosomes. What's the size of a eukaryotic ribosome? It's 80s. Chloroplasts also have 70s ribosomes. They also have their own DNA and it's circular. Remember that eukaryotic cells have linear DNA. You take all of these together and the current theory is that these originally came from prokaryotes that were engulfed by eukaryotic cells and eventually took up a symbiotic relationship within the eukaryotic cell to the benefit of everybody involved. Mitochondria were engulfed first. We say that because all eukaryotic cells have mitochondria and later on some eukaryotic cells engulfed some photosynthetic bacteria that became chloroplasts and this led to the algae and plant cell lineages. Now we have more than just the theory that comes from um, the theory coming from the data. We've also taken the DNA from mitochondria and sequenced it and they're really closely related to proteobacteria. You have some pro uh, proteobacteria in your gut, E. coli. Okay, so your mitochondria are closely related to this family. And chloroplasts are very closely related to another group of photosynthetic bacteria called cyanobacteria. They used to be called blue-green algae. It's very interesting. Well, that's it for this chapter. Um, I have here in summary some diagrams of prokaryotes and eukaryotes. And you might want to be able to remember these. Uh, be able to uh, fill in this diagram because I don't know, it might show up on the test.